How's it going, guys? So high yield vascular differentials presentation for you, Similia. Just hop through some uh, big conditions for you. Crowded stenosis caused by atherosclerosis. And you also want to know that hypertension is the biggest risk factor. You have the strong systolic impulse from the heart pounding the carotids, causing endothelial damage, which is going to lead to atheromatous development. Now, this is a bit interesting because if we are not talking about the carotids, in other words, we're talking about the abdominal aorta, the popliteals, the coronaries, in terms of what's most acceleratory for atherosclerosis, diabetes, then smoking, then hypertension, in that order for what is most acceleratory. But when we're talking about the carotids, we're talking about hypertension, because we specifically have that systolic impulse, that proximity to the heart. And then in general, in the population, the most common risk factor, not the most acceleratory, the most common risk factor for atherosclerosis everywhere in the body, that's also hypertension. So I talk about this in my high health risk factors PDF. You can read more about that stuff there. Just letting you know that carotid brewery is not mandatory in question. Some students think you have to see uh, that's a sound in the neck on auscultation. You don't. Okay, and then uh, what's going to happen is the vignette might give you a stroke, a TIA, or a retinal artery occlusion in the setting of a patient who has high blood pressure, and you just got to instantly know that that's an atheromatous plaque that's launched off to the brain slash eye almost always. Okay, so that's how carotid stenosis is generally going to present. And you're going to do carotid duplex ultrasound as the next best step. Okay, so I've never seen carotid angiography as a correct answer on US simile. In theory, you could do that after the carotid duplex ultrasound, looking for a degree of occlusion. Uh, but if you get a vignette, let's say 65 year old dude, hypertension, TIA, you're just going to choose carotid duplex ultrasound. Guidelines have shifted over the years as far as what the cutoffs are for when you do an NR directomy. US simile actually doesn't give a fuck. Okay, so you can, of course, learn that greater than 70% symptomatic, greater than 80% asymptomatic. Symptomatic means the patient has had a stroke, a TIA, or a retinal artery occlusion. A brewery is a sign, not a symptom. But what the vignette might do is just give you a patient who has a TIA, and the they do a carotid duplex ultrasound, and the degree of occlusion they tell you is 90%. They don't make it borderline, or they tell you it's 30%, okay? And then you're going to uh, do endorectomy if you're over those thresholds. If you're under the thresholds, you're going to do a triad of medical management. Okay, so they want a statin, number one. Number two, they want ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II receptor blocker. Number three, they want antiplatelet therapy. US simile is not going to force you to choose low versus high intensity statins. That tends to be QBank nonsense. Occasionally, students will ask about that. It's my observation lisinopril is the drug that shows up all the time in NBMEs for what they choose. Uh, for hypertension management, but in theory, it could be any, it could be candesartan by all means, an ARB. And then it's also to my observation that US simile tends to just be okay with aspirin alone as antiplatelet therapy. So you can have aspirin alone, you can have the combo of aspirin dipritamol, you can have clopidogrel alone, but aspirin alone is sufficient NBME vignettes as per my observation. And what they like doing is, let's say they'll give you a 65-year-old dude, hypertension, he has a TIA, you do the carotid duplex ultrasound, occlusion's 50% below the threshold, and then they'll tell you he's on aspirin and lisinopril. And what should be done? The answer is add a statin. Or they'll tell you he's on a statin and lisinopril. What should be done? Add aspirin. So you got to know that triad, and it's easy. You just add the third drug. And another thing they can do is tell you the patient's below the anarterectomy threshold and is already on all three of those drugs. And then the answer is no further modifications necessary or continue current regimen. That's on the NVMe exam. Okay, so, uh, I mean, pretty much as I said, it's just... It, it's going to be hypertension in the vignette plus a TIA stroke or an artery occlusion, but that's that's most vignettes, but it's not mandatory. They can give you a 65-year-old dude who has a stroke TIA or an artery occlusion, no other information, and you're just going to do a carotid duplex ultrasound. Okay, so just be aware that that's possible on the NBME. And don't confuse a TIA, for instance, with syncope, which is fainting. And syncope tends to be reflective of arrhythmia, usually atrial fibrillation. And you're going to do an, a regular ECG first if listed. If not listed, you're just going to choose 24-hour ambulatory ECG, which is a Holter monitor for unexplained syncope. But if it's stroke TIA retinal artery occlusion, you're going to do the carotid duplex ultrasound. Okay, so 
Uh, I'm just making a point tangentially that the triad of antiplatelet therapy, statin, ACE, inhibitor, ARB, is also for peripheral vascular disease in general, uh, i.e. patients intermittent claudication, okay? Uh, decreased ABIs, okay, ankle brachial indices, you also can do that triad. It's not just for carotid stenosis. And, okay, so this is an interesting point about carotid stenosis, is that, for example, if they give you a patient who has high aldosterone and high blood pressure, they say, like, 60-year-old woman has, and they don't give you risk factors, let's say, because if you, if, if you have hypertension, diabetes, smoking, you know it's going to be atherosclerosis anyway. But if they give you high aldosterone, and uh, they tell you that there's a carotid brewery, you can make that association that there's, if there's atherosclerosis in one location, the carotids, isn't it safe to say there's going to be atherosclerosis in other locations, the popliteals, the coronaries, the renal arteries? So that's how you know the diagnosis can be renal artery stenosis if we have high aldosterone, if they also tell you there's carotid stenosis. Because a student will ask, how do you know it's not an aldosterone screening tumor? Well, they say that there's atherosclerosis in one location, so it's going to be in another location. And the same goes for fibromuscular dysplasia. It can occasionally affect the carotids. That's when you have a narrowing of the renal arteries in young women, not related to atherosclerosis. So clavian steel syndrome, obscure diagnosis when you're first learning about this type of thing where... Uh, this, and we could do a long, lengthy anatomy discussion, which will really bore the shit out of you. But you should know that the subclavians, which go to the left and right arms, you have the first branch that comes off, the vertebrals, and those are going to go to the brain. Okay, They ascend through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae. But the point is, if you have a narrowing of the proximal subclavian arteries prior to where the vertebrals branch off, then that could cause low blood pressure, low blood flow in those vertebral arteries, and sometimes even a backflow. And this can lead to dizziness, syncope, can lead to miscellaneous uh, neurophenomena. And they'll tell you that the blood pressure is different between the arms sometimes. And this is notable because about three out of four times, three out of four vignettes, blood pressure is different between the arms. That's aortic dissection, which I'll talk about more. But about one out of four times, it can be subclavian steel syndrome. So they'll give you a, a patient who has dizziness and blood pressure is different between the arms. And you just got to know that's a buzzy presentation for subclavian steel syndrome straight up as the answer, or the answer could be backflow in a vertebral artery. Okay. If you, if you learn it now, it's not hard when you see it on the NBME. Or they'll tell you the patient has dizziness and they say the blood pressure in the left arm is X. What's the next best step? The answer is check blood pressure in the, in the other arm. Okay. I mean, I don't really know what to tell you. It's on the NBME exam. As I just fucking said, uh, blood pressure in between the arms, usually aortic dissection, but it can also be subclavian steel. You're going to do CT or MR angiography as the next best step in diagnosis. They ask that on the 2CK NBME. Vertebral artery stenosis is going to present with the same symptoms, dizziness, un just rant, I keep wanting to say unexplained, miscellaneous neurophenomena, uh, but you're not going to have difference in blood pressure between the arms because the subclavians aren't affected. Okay, so when we say what's causing the stenosis, whether it's carotid stenosis, renal artery stenosis, vertebral artery stenosis, it's atherosclerosis, holy shit. So usually patients risk factors. CT, MR, angiography is going to diagnose. And then I'm just making this point that occasionally you might see vertebro bacillar insufficiency show up either in resources uh, or elsewhere. I mean, I, I mean, I haven't seen this term specifically on the US simile. I'm just letting you know. If you're studying this stuff and you see it and you say, how is that different from vertebral artery stenosis or subclavian steel syndrome? It's just an umbrella term that refers to either. Okay, so vertebral artery dissection. Uh, you should just know that a false lumen can occur in the vertebral artery going to the brain and that uh, you can get clots forming due to the stasis, okay? And then you're going to give heparin, which sounds weird because it's arterial. We think of heparin being given DVT, pulmonary embolism, which are venous etiologies, but it's on one of the two CK NVMEs where they have heparin as the answer. Um, but vertebral artery dissection, carotid artery dissection, also acute limb ischemia, patients who have atrial fib, atrial fib with a left atrial male thrombus launches off to a leg. Heparin can be part of the management for these arterial related conditions. And you should know that chiropractor neck manipulation is a high yield cause of vertebral artery dissection. Okay, it shows up one of the NBME forms. Now, 
uh, our segue into carotid artery dissection is this is going to be a stroke like presentation in a patient with ipsilateral neck slash facial pain. Okay. And the reason you're getting a stroke like presentation is because similar to the vertebral artery dissection, you can get a clot forming within the false lumen that can embolize to the brain. So uh, you're going to give heparin similarly, okay, as, as the management. And then the you say, well, why is there pain? And there's stretching of nociceptors apparently due to the vascular dilation. It shows up on the NBME exam. So aortic dissection. You also want to know it's the most, I didn't mention it here, but uh, because it's sort of self-explanatory, but aortic dissection is classically ripping slash severe chest pain that goes to the back. Okay, that's your textbook presentation, but the vignette actually doesn't even have to mention that. Okay, they can often just say a patient has aortic regurgitation, has a connective tissue disorder, and you need to know that that's dissection. There might not even be a mention of pain there. All right, so the dissection can retrograde propagate to the aortic root and cause aortic regurg, and that's going to be your diastolic murmur. Okay, your holo diastolic murmur, decrescendo holo diastolic murmur, early diastolic murmur, okay, different descriptors for aortic regurg. So you should be thinking um, that in the setting of dissection. So medial necrosis, cystic medial necrosis, resources have ten tended to mention cystic medial necrosis as Marfan syndrome. It's not limited to Marfan syndrome. There's an NBME question floating around where they have medial necrosis in the setting of hypertension. Okay, so these terms are interchangeable. So hypertension, connective tissue disorders, uh, they can ask that path term for what's occurring, causing the dissection. Okay, and your blood pressure can be different between the arms if your aortic dissection spans between where the subclavians are coming off the aortic arch, obviously brachiocephalic for the right, but um, that, that explains why you have a difference in blood pressure between the arms. And I'm just letting you know that there's a very fucking obscure vignette out there where they say that blood pressure is different between the legs. Holy shit. Okay, so they, they say blood pressure in the left leg is X. And then the blood pressure in the right leg is different. You're like, how the hell is that possible? Where the answer on the NBME form is thoracic aortic dissection. And it's because in theory, you could have this debakey type one where it anterograde propagates all the way down to the aortic bifurcation and the common iliacs. Uh, and that can cause differential blood pressure between the legs. So I'm just letting you know that this NBME question exists. Okay. That the blood pressure can in theory be different between the legs. Aortic dissection, they are not going to ask you what's the next best step where the answer is chest x-ray. They will basically always just tell you in the stem that chest x-ray shows widening of the mediastinum. What's the next best step now? And the answer is CT of the chest or CT angiography. They're the same thing. If you don't see either of those listed, you're going to choose aortic angiography or aortography. That's what I've deduced based on answers on the NBME. Okay, so that's the sequence you want to go by. And then I'm just letting you know that labetalol is the first drug they want. So if they list labetalol uh, and nitroprusside as separate answers, you're going to choose labetalol. I'm just making a point here that ascending aortic aneurysm is treated with labetalol in surgery, descending is labetalol alone. That's more of a lower yield nitpicky point, more step three. But uh, the key take home for this uh, section is that labetalol is the first drug they want over nitroprusside. Traumatic rupture of aorta. Okay, don't confuse with aortic dissection, which we said was hypertension. Okay, connective tissue disorders. Traumatic rupture is going to be deceleration injury. Car, it's the most common cause of death from car accident fall. And similarly, they're going to give you a widening of the mediastinum on, mediastinum on chest x-ray. You're going to do CT the chest, CT angiography if they're not listed. Aortography, aortic angiography. Same deal, labetalol first line uh, before nitroprusside. And then I'm letting you know that even if they give you blood pressure low in the setting of traumatic rupture or dissection, you're going to choose labetalol anyway okay there's a vignette out there where they give like blood pressure 80 on 50 and answer still labetalol okay and then i'm also letting you know questions floating around where esmolol plus nitroprusside combined as the answer is correct where labetalol is not listed because if i don't mention this and you get esmolol and nitroprusside you're like oh mike said labetalol okay so i'm just letting you know aortic aneurysm can present as visible pulsation on us and if it's thoracic, they can say visible pulsation above the manubrium, pulsatile mass above the manubrium. It can also cause a tracheal shift. I've seen students choose pneumothorax. And this is why you do questions, okay, as part of your prep for USMLE or integral to your prep because you learn, oh, wow, like tracheal shift isn't limited to pneumothoraces. Holy shit. Okay, so, and likewise for AAA, rather than a visible pulsation above the manubrium, they can say a visible pulsation or pulsatile mass in the epigastrium. 
And then the biggest risk factor for thoracic uh, aortic aneurysm is hypertension. Biggest risk factor for the AAA is smoking. And then 2CK stuff real quick is that family med, you're going to do a one-off bone ultrasound, 65 old and older for men and women who are ever smokers. And then for surgery, they want you to know that you're only going to repair it if the AAA is greater than 5.5 centimeters or it's grown greater than 0.5 centimeters per month for the past six months. And then they can ask questions like, they'll give you a four centimeter AAA and they say, why were serial ultrasounds chosen as the management? And the answer is size of the aneurysm, as in it's too small. Or they'll say it's a four centimeter aneurysm. What's the next best step? Surgery is wrong. And the answer is just serial ultrasounds. Okay, and then I'm just letting you know that you do perioperative. Uh, to assess perioperative MI risk, we do stress tests. And a pharmacologic stress test can be what they do prior to uh, patients who have a AAA repair, okay? There's a question where that's the answer. They don't list exercise stress tests as another answer choice. But uh, in theory, patients who have a fragile and large AAA uh, above the threshold requiring surgery, you can do a pharmacologic stress test. An interesting factoid is diabetes is weirdly protective of aneurysm, uh, of, of abdominal aortic aneurysm because of stiffening of the vascular wall due to non-enzymatic like oscillation. And then patients who are terminal, who have advanced disease such as metastatic cancer, they want you to know that you're not gonna do surgeries such as AAA repair. Okay, so not highly dramatic. Okay, I'm obviously gonna make more presentations, can make these 90 minutes, uh, but I figure I'll just limit these somewhat. Uh, so yeah, I'll put out more clips, that's it.